good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the 20th season of the Congressional Biomedical Research Cau um, Caucus presentations. I'd like to first thank the co-chairs of the caucus, Congressman um, Brian Bilbray from California, Mike Castle from Delaware, Jackie Spear from California, and Rush Holt from New Jersey, um, all for their commitment and dedication to the caucus. I'd also like to thank the Howard Hughes Medical Institute for its support of the caucuses through a generous grant. Um, as you've noticed, we videotape every briefing. You can find past briefings on the CLS website at the Coalition for Life Sciences.org. And at that site, you can register for our RSS feeds in order to be alerted to future postings. Um, one more quick announcement before we move on to the speaker. We are winding down our 2010 caucus season, including today's briefing. We have three remaining briefings left. Um, the last two will be held in September. We hope to see you all then and, in, and that you all enjoy your August break. Um, so without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. John Tisdale. Dr. Tisdale is a senior investigator at, in the molecular and clinical hematology branch at the National Institutes of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases, as well as the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, both at the National Institutes of Health. He received his medical degree at the Medical University of South Carolina. He has authored and co-authored several research papers. Today, he is here to discuss his most recent and groundbreaking study on partial bone marrow replacement therapy, therapy, specifically the use of bone marrow stem cells as a vehicle for gene therapy. So please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Tisdale. Well, first I'd like to uh, uh, express my thanks for the opportunity to present our work. Um, we're just up the road on Rockville Pike at the National Institutes of Health, where um, our real focus is on sickle cell disease. So I'll be, I'll be talking about the use of stem cells in, in, in the quotes, gene therapy application. Uh, but, but all of this will be in the context of, uh, of sickle cell disease, our main uh, target disease. So I'd like to start with this slide because um, it, it's, it, it, it demonstrates that sickle cell disease was actually the first disease for which the molecular defect was identified. And this was by Linus Pauling and colleagues. And uh, he went on to get the Nobel Prize for his, uh, his work in, um, in proteins uh, at this time. It was later found to be uh, the result of a single substitution, so one misspelling uh, in the gene for hemoglobin at posi position six of the beta globin chain. And this results in an abnormal hemoglobin in red cells that's prone to polymerization at low oxygen. So when these red cells take oxygen from the lungs to the tissues, this hemoglobin can polymerize, making the red cells sickle in, sh in shape and then become uh, deformed and rigid and lodge in, in, in the circulation. This causes severe anemia, frequent vaso-occlusive pain crises. So when these red cells clog up the circulation, whatever's being supplied by that blood uh, doesn't get its blood supply. So if it's the muscles, the muscles hurt, the bones, the bones hurt. If it's the brain, it results in a stroke. If it's the kidney, kidney failure, uh, the lungs, it can cause high blood pressure in the lungs. So really a lot of complications that these patients must endure lifelong uh, and repeatedly. Uh, and this results in a markedly shortened lifespan. The most recent estimate was 38 years uh, for individuals with this disease. So this abnormal hemoglobin in red cells that come from bone marrow stem cells really makes this an ideal disorder for a hematopoietic stem cell-based approach. So I'll first start off, uh, start off by defining uh, what is a stem cell. You've probably um, had some lectures in this regard, but let me, let me at least back up so that we're all on the same page. So stem cells are found in multicellular organisms, and they have two properties that define themselves. First, they can renew themselves through uh, division, so they can make a copy of themselves. And they can also differentiate to a diverse range of specialized tissues and cell types. So for the bone marrow, for example, they can make all the elements of the blood. There are different sources of stem cells, and um, I'll be concentrating on somatic stem cells. These are also called adult stem cells. You've heard a lot about these. These are harvested from the organ that they repopulate. They're multipotent in that they can make all of the pieces of this organ, but they're probably specific to that organ only. Uh, there had been some publications now about a decade ago that suggested that these adult stem cells could make other types of tissues. I don't think that that's true, and this has actually not turned out to be the case for most of the early publications. Uh, 
Uh, but there are many established uses of uh, somatic stem cells, including bone marrow transplant, which I'll mostly be telling you about today. There are also embryonic stem cells, and these differ from somatic stem cells in that they can differentiate into the, all of the tissues uh, of the body. They're derived from the inner cell mass of an embryo, making them uh, problematic uh, ethically. And they're also encumbered by uh, technical issues that make them very difficult to grow and to keep in the lab. Uh, so this is still in its infancy. But I'll touch a little bit on this before I move on to our work in bone marrow transplantation. So because these cells uh, were mostly encumbered ethically, uh, investigators went on to try and figure out if there were other ways to derive embryonic stem cells that didn't require uh, 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 taking these cells from an, from, a, from an embryo. So this single cell blastomere removal where you just take one cell away, uh, this retains the, uh, the, the embryo's ability to implant. You can derive these from what were considered dead embryos. These are embryos that were produced in IVF clinics and then did not differentiate and therefore weren't able to be implanted. You can do parthenogenesis, which is to activate a non-fertilized egg, and sometimes you can get embryonic stem cells to grow. Or you can do somatic cell nuclear transplantation. Now, this is something that's been done for a long time. It was first done in frogs probably 40 years ago. It was used to clone the sheep dolly that was the first large animal to be cloned, where you just take the nucleus out of a cell and put it into the nucleus of an egg and try and get that going. Um, there was a publication that got a lot of uh, attention several years back by a Korean group where they derived stem cells using this somatic cell nuclear transplantation. It turns out that most of these were falsified, and some of the, um, some of the individuals that actually donated eggs were, were individuals that worked in this lab. So this really shrouded this kind of technology in, in, in controversy, so many abandoned this. And at the same time, new regulations uh, considered all of these techniques to be uh, creating embryos and protected them under the same guidelines as embryonic stem cells had been previously. So investigators looked for new methods to derive embryonic stem cells, again, free from these ethical and, um, and hopefully technical issues. So a group in Japan was looking at whether you could take just normal cells and redirect them to an embryonic fate by introducing different growth factors. Uh, during their um, division, and they tried a whole host of different growth factors. And just by, um, uh, by really a tour de force, came up with four factors when exposed to simple skin cells could convert these cells into embryonic-like uh, stem cells. And so these are called induced pluripotent stem cells, so IPS cells. And they're pluripotent by all criteria in that they can make all the different types of cells of the body. And they really behave just like embryonic stem cells by all measurements uh, so far. <clears throat> and again, they're simply a skin cell or some other cell that's been done with many other types of cells now that have been turned back to a very primitive state by the introduction of these uh, primitive factors here. And the first real proof of concept that these cells could be used to fix a disease was actually in sickle cell disease. So there are mice now that have been genetically um, uh, made to express human sickle hemoglobin. So these mice have sickle cell disease. They have uh, all of the same problems that humans with sickle cell disease have. So what they did is they took these mice and collected skin cells and then exposed these skin cells in culture to these four growth factors that the Yamanaki group uh, discovered and then made genetically identical iPS cells. So these are just like embryonic stem cells from this mouse. They can then correct the mutation simply by uh, homologous recombination. This is a technique that can be used in cell culture. And then these genetically corrected cells that now have the, the correct hemoglobin are differentiated into blood-forming cells and then transplanted back into the same mouse that the skin cells were taken from. And these mice were cured of their sickle cell disease. So this demonstrates at least that this concept of induced pluripotent stem cells can be used to correct a genetic disorder. But there are a lot of uh, things that still need to be worked out before this can reach the clinic. How efficient is the differentiation from the IPS nuclear It's extremely inefficient, and um, no one's been able to do it yet with human cells. So that's been one of the really big problems, uh, and one of the reasons why we've stuck to hematopoietic stem cells, because we can get these cells easily from humans, um, either by doing a bone marrow aspirate in the clinic or by giving a hormone that makes these cells circulate in the bloodstream, and we can collect them. Uh, uh, in literally just a few hours. And we know they make blood uh, very well. So hematopoietic stem cells reconstitute all of the blood elements, uh, B cells, T cells, NK cells, dendritic cells. These are all specialized immune cells. Uh, 
Uh, platelets, these are the cells that clot the blood, and red cells are the cells that carry uh, hemoglobin, which carries oxygen around. And these are obviously the cells that we want to correct in sickle cell disease. So if we could correct back here at the hematopoietic stem cell level, not only would we be able to correct sickle cell disease, but a whole host of other diseases, including the immunodeficiencies that children are sometimes born with, the boy in the bubble disease, they have absent T cells, and a number of other diseases that affect the bone marrow compartment. So we've divided our approach into two, two prongs. One is allogeneic stem cell transplantation. That just means stem cells from somebody else. Uh, and this usually requires a brother or a sister that's a match, an HLA match. This is a, a sort of immune fingerprint. We take these cells and give to the patient after, after trying to knock out their own cells, and hopefully the new cells from the donor will grow up and reconstitute the blood system. Or autologous stem cell gene transfer. So autologous just means your own stem cells. So we collect the patient's own bone marrow stem cells. And in the case of sickle cell disease, we transfer the gene that carries the correct hemoglobin. So to do this, we engineer viruses, uh, and we use retroviruses for this, because vi these are viruses that permanently integrate themselves into the chromosome of these uh, bone marrow stem cells. So once this bone marrow stem cell goes back and starts dividing, it'll recopy this gene over and over, so that when the red cells grow up, they have a copy of the correct gene. So either take the patient's um, brother or sister, and, and give these cells or take the patient's own cells after we correct them and put them back in. So we've known that bone marrow transplant from somebody else can cure sickle cell disease for more than a decade. And this is a publication from 1996 from Mark Walter's group that showed that you could cure kids of sickle cell disease if you take a brother or sister's bone marrow. You give them high doses of chemotherapy and radiation and knock out their own bone marrow and infuse this bone marrow and it'll replace it with uh, normal functioning marrow. But some years later, in 2001, they looked back at now 50 patients that they had treated with this approach and found that not all patients had complete replacement of their bone marrow. So even though they'd given chemotherapy to completely wipe out their bone marrow and given, and, and given them a new bone marrow, some patients had as few as 10 percent of their donors' bone marrow take, and 90 percent of their own bone marrow survived. And even with that low of, a, of what we term engraftment, these patients were cured. So that told us that we don't have to actually completely ablate the patient's bone marrow. And that's the, a real toxic part of this kind of approach. Perhaps we could just try to get it in partially and still cure the disease. And the fact that this approach had been limited to children and the fact that there's a, there's a complication that occurs frequently uh, called graft-versus-host disease where the new immune cells of the donor actually try to uh, uh, attack the patient we really wanted to try and explore this sort of partial bone marrow transplant approach because we thought if we could get a mixture between donor and recipient, we could, we could get a cure of the disease and we could avoid this biggest complication of graft-versus-host disease, which can be fatal and can be debilitating as, as debilitating as sickle cell disease. So we went back to the mouse, and I'll show you a little bit of the, uh, of the, the scientific underpinnings of this, this recent study so that we could specifically develop a, a regimen for getting a mixture between the two, the patient and, the, and their donor, um, and that would allow for what we call in the um, transplant world tolerance. So this is where both immune systems can coexist together without either this problem of graft-versus-host disease or the problem that the patient just does not accept the graft and rejects it. So we used um, a mouse model for doing this. This is a mouse model that normally would reject this bone marrow if you tried to put it in. We collect the bone marrow, as I told you, um, we do now in the clinic by giving this hormone GCSF and then just collect the blood uh, which contains these stem cells. And then we infuse these stem cells into these mice after giving a very low uh, dose relatively of radiation of 300 centigrade. We usually give 12 to 1500 in the transplant setting and that would completely ablate their bone marrow. 300 centigrade will just knock their counts down for a little bit and then they recover. And then we treated them with a one month course of either cyclosporin, which is a conventional immunosuppressive drug, or a drug rapamycin, which was then a, a novel immunosuppressive drug at that time. And then we just looked in their blood to see how much a donor was coming. So why did we choose this new drug rapamycin? This is a cartoon of the immune system, specifically a T cell which is the cell that would normally reject the graft when we try to put it in, and the cell that once it came in from donor would try to reject the patient. So this is the cell that we want to uh, teach uh, to be tolerant. 
And when it encounters something that it sees as foreign, in the context of, of what we call second signals, it liberates growth factors such as IL-2 that makes these cells grow and start to fight against whatever it is that's being recognized. This first signal in the, second, in, in the absence of these second signals renders T cells energic and is required for this tolerance that we want to try to achieve. Now cyclosporin, which is a conventional immunosuppressive drug, is really good at, at suppressing the immune system, but it blocks this activation through the T cell. So it blocks this uh, signal one. So theoretically, while it's a good immunosuppressive drug, it would also block tolerance. On the other hand, rapamycin blocks uh, this IL-2-dependent growth of these T cells. So it allows this first signal without the second signal, so theoretically could make T cells energic and, and therefore tolerant uh, to the new graft. So this shows what happens in these mice that we treated with uh, 300 uh, centigrade radiation in either cyclosporin or rapamycin. The shaded areas when they were getting the immunosuppressive drug. And here you can see we only had donor cells at about 10% in the cyclosporin treated mice, and then they lost this uh, over follow-up. But the rapamycin treated mice had levels of about 80% long-term, even in the absence of uh, continued immunosuppression. And this is very different than a conventional bone marrow transplant, which would require these patients to take uh, sometimes lifelong immunosuppression. We then applied it to the same type of uh, sickle cell transgenic mice. So these are mice that have only hemoglobin S. This is a hemoglobin S in a control mouse. This is a hemoglobin diffuse pattern of a donor type mouse. And these are three mice that we transplanted with this regimen. And you can see their sickle cell hemoglobin was replaced by the uh, hemoglobin diffuse pattern of the donor. And this was, again, at very low levels of mixed chimerism, so around 10% of donor cells in the circulation. And despite that, all of the red cells had switched over to donor. So now we have a protocol open uh, for adults with severe sickle cell disease. And this has always been the problem because adults have declared themselves as having severe disease. And by then, it's too late to do a transplant because transplants are toxic. Uh, there are side effects that require that you have very good organ function to tolerate. And by the time adults have declared themselves as having severe disease, it's really too late to apply a transplant because you wouldn't think that they'd be able to tolerate the side effects. But with this new approach, we thought we could, uh, we, we could uh, indeed uh, move forward to uh, treatment of adults. So these criteria just define patients who have a high risk for early mortality. And this is where we wanted to start uh, our treatment. Uh, this I show for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, we, we, we had to screen a number of patients to find 10 patients to transplant. Um, most, in fact, didn't have a related donor. So of the 112 patients that we looked at, 88 didn't have a matched donor. 24 um, were eligible, and we've transplanted now 10 that we've uh, recently reported, and I'll show you uh, the results. Many of these other patients are now going through the transplant procedure. Patients eight, uh, ranged in age from 16 uh, to 45, and we've recently transplanted uh, a 65-year-old. And they all had uh, homozygous sickle cell disease except for one. This is a variant, hemoglobin SC, that's also severe in this patient. But the point of this slide is to show that they had multiple complications of their disease uh, and were requiring uh, red cell uh, uh, transfusions and the one drug that we have to treat this disease, hydroxyurea. So these, these were very sick patients at baseline. All of these patients tolerated the transplant well, and as opposed to a standard transplant where they wind up on nutritional support by IV, IV antibiotics for weeks on end with fevers, uh, we had none of these complications in, this pace, in these patients. No acute or chronic graft-versus-host disease, which I said is the major problem that we see in more than half of adult patients uh, with a conventional transplant, and no sickle cell related events uh, during the peritransplant period, and nine of the ten patients now have had stable reversal of their disease. This I show is um, a chimerism again. A, a, again, this is a percentage of cells from their donor in the circulation over the uh, first 30 months trans post-transplant. And I've just broken it down into the immune cells that reject, which are you know, more modestly at about 50% overall. And then uh, myeloid cells, which are our first defense against infection. These are granulocytes. Um, at about 90% overall in these patients. And all of these patients remain mixed, so all of them still had their own bone marrow making blood. And with this mixture, they all normalized their hemoglobin over the uh, year uh, post-transplant. So you can see patients with sickle cell disease um, have very low hemoglobins, and uh, this reflects uh, chronic transfusion in most of them. And here they are at uh, a normal level now, more than one year 
uh, post-transplantation. And one of the things that was most satisfying is that patients with sickle cell disease were often on chronic narcotics for repeated vaso-occlusive crises and on pretty hefty doses. So this is the IV morphine equivalent per week of our patients at the time of transplant. So 1,000 milligrams per week of IV morphine equivalent uh, at the time of transplant. And you can see, though, it took us some time, almost six months, to wean everybody off. All patients came off of uh, narcotics. And um, patients with sickle cell disease suffer with many things, uh, not the least of which is the assumption by many when they hit the ER that they're there just to get narcotics. And um, this is a problem that they, they struggle with uh, lifelong. Uh, and if, if, uh, if addiction to narcotics were really a, a feature of this disease, then we wouldn't be able to get these patients off of narcotics. But the, the trick is to get rid of their pain. When you, when, you, when you get rid of their pain, they no longer need narcotics. So all of these patients were off narcotics. So this relatively simple procedure allows us to actually revert the disease in patients with very severe disease as adults. The splitter mixed chimerism, you know, this mixture of both patient and recipient, suggests tolerance, which is really the holy grail of transplant. Uh, but, a, but we certainly need longer follow-up in these patients and further accrual. This is only 10 patients, so this is really early to say this is a home run, but we're at least uh, very pleased with the results so far. But the, the one slide that I showed you with uh, 119 patients that we screened really tells us we have to do more because this is, you know, barely 10 percent of the population that we can approach in this way. So alternative sources still need exploration. So this, this concept of taking the, the patient's own bone marrow cells and, and correcting them is, is, is one that's been around now for more than two decades. And it's a relatively simple procedure as well where we take the bone marrow cells, we, we, we put them in the presence of a vector. Uh, which is carrying the gene that's corrective, and in this case we use viruses, to put this gene into these bone marrow stem cells and then put them back and have them reconstitute just like a regular bone marrow transplant. And when I first started in the lab now 16 years ago, we could do this in mice really easily. We could fix anything in a mouse. We could get 50 to 60 percent of their cells carrying whatever gene we put in. And when we took these same techniques and applied it to human cells in the flask, in the lab, we'd get 50, 60 percent. So we were really excited about moving to the clinic and did so about 16 years ago, testing this approach in patients who were getting a transplant for some other reason and just putting a marker gene in that we could look for long term. And it turned out that in contrast to the mouse where we could get 50 percent of the cells corrected, we got levels of 1 in 100,000 in humans to 1 in a million requiring very sensitive techniques to find these cells. And then they went away after the first six months. So we really had to go back to the drawing board because one in 100,000 is not enough to fix any disease. Um, and we really needed to reach levels of more like 5 or 10 percent to even approach some of the more simple uh, protein defect uh, disorders. So we went back and developed the non-human primate competitive repopulation model because the, the non-human primate really better estimates what's happening with hematopoietic stem cells. So we ask a lot of questions, and I won't bore you with all the details, but this represents about 10 years of work trying to figure out why it didn't work in humans. But the main thing was that when we took these stem cells out of the bone marrow and put them in a flask for four days and exposed them to a virus at very high concentration, they just weren't stem cells anymore when we put them back in. So they didn't engraft and they didn't in contribute to the blood, and only the cells that remained in the animals uh, reconstituted the blood. And this was you know, again at one in a million. So we developed ways of supporting these stem cells to keep them stem cells by adding different kinds of growth factors and support elements. And we went from one in a million cells in the circulation to about 10 percent. And then we developed clinically feasible methods using all reagents that are human, uh, uh, human derived and already in the clinic for human transplant applications. And then we demonstrated that we really had the true uh, stem cell biomathematical modeling approach. So this really suggested that we should be able to at least approach some simple enzyme uh, disorders like severe combined immunodeficiency. And in fact, uh, in the following year, the French group showed that using these exact same techniques, using bone marrow from kids that were just born with severe combined immunodeficiency, a universally fatal disease by the first year, these kids were corrected of their immune defect by taking these bone marrow cells and introducing the missing gene. There have been some problems on this trial. If anybody's interested in talking about, we can talk about during the question and answer. But our biggest problem has been that, okay, for a simple disorder, we can just do this now by getting 5 or 10 percent. But in sickle cell disease, we need more like 20 percent, and we need it regulated. We need it only turned on in red cells at a certain time during their development. So it makes it much more complicated. 
We know the genes that control this. We can put those into these viruses too. But every time we did it with the viruses that we were using before, the viruses would recombine. They wouldn't transfer the gene. And you know, you know, three and four years would go by testing different constructs, and we seemed to get nowhere. Until Michel Satellin's group uh, switched from a mouse virus to a human virus for transferring the gene. And it, it so happens that the human virus that they used was HIV. And HIV um, integrates into cells permanently, just like other retroviruses, but can infect non-dividing cells. So it's very appealing for stem cells because they're cells that really don't usually divide. So it can be gutted of all of its elements that, that cause infection um, in humans, and you can put the correct gene back in. And when Michel did this, he could correct uh, a mouse model of thalassemia, which is another disease of hemoglobin uh, that's very similar to sickle cell disease. And this was the first demonstration that, that this virus could be used to, to transfer this kind of complex uh, payload. So we together went on to develop the non-human primate model to really test this approach. And we had to modify the, the human beta globin because human rhesus is almost identical in every way that you look at it, the, the hemoglobin. So we changed the spelling just a little bit so we could see the difference between the two. We made vector both in HIV, as he did, and in simian immunodeficiency virus, because this is a virus that infects the monkey cells better, and developed the assays to start testing this uh, in the monkey. So here, here is a, a collection of bone marrow stem cells. This is a marker, CD34, that marks that stem cell compartment. So we isolate those cells, and then we expose them to this HIV-carrying human hemoglobin. And here you can see this is monkey hemoglobin, and this is human hemoglobin. So after we grow out the red cells from this, you can see about 50% of the cells are expressing human hemoglobin. So these are levels now that would be, if we could get this in, in the animal after transplant, would correct the disease. And so then we started transplantation studies, and this is one animal where we collected the CD34 cells, put this gene in, uh, ablated their bone marrow with radiation, and then put the stem cells back and then looked for human hemoglobin in their blood. And this is at day 30, so this is 0% human, 1, 5, you can start to see, 10, 25% human, and this is the animal at day 30. So you can see about 5% of the hemoglobin is human in origin uh, and coming from the gene that we delivered to their bone marrow stem cells. We confirm this by a number of other ways because often these kinds of assays can overestimate uh, what you see over time. But unfortunately, when we followed these two animals that we treated in this way, these levels fell off to undetectable by 37 weeks. So we're back to the drawing board now. We can get 10% with a normal gene, but again with hemoglobin, we're having trouble. But what we discovered was that, in others, was that the, the rhesus has a block to infection by HIV, so they're resistant to HIV infection, but their stem cells are also resistant to HIV as a vector for transferring these um, genes. So we made chimeric viruses between HIV and SIV to see if we could get around this block and get uh, more efficiently into the stem cell compartment. And so we just combined a bunch of different elements of the two viruses to see can we make virus? And if we can make virus, do these viruses work equally well with human and rhesus cells? So the ones where we added one factor from SIV or another factor from SIV, VIF and capsid, we can make very, very good virus, and then we tested them on cell lines. So here you can see this is normal HIV. So normal HIV works very well with human cells. Here you can see in brown. But virtually uh, 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 no transduction in rhesus cells. But if we add this uh, simian capsid to HIV, uh, to HIV, you can see we restore HIV's ability to infect uh, in rhesus cells uh, just as it does in humans. So we call this chimeric HIV now, chi HIV, and have tested this in vivo. So this is our competitive repopulation model. We collect these bone marrow stem cells from monkeys, and then we just split them in half and let the monkey serve as its own control. One we transduced with this chimeric HIV vector, and this time we're using a marker gene, which is a fluorescence protein. Uh, green fluorescence protein. This is a protein that makes the jellyfish uh, glow. So if we put this GFP in, all the cells that are expressing it will glow under a fluorescent microscope green. Or we take the standard HIV vector that we're trying to improve upon, and in this case make it express yellow fluorescent protein. So then we combine these two products back into the animal and transplant, and then we can simply look at whether green or yellow cells predominate in the animal, and then we can tell if we've made any improvement. So this shows a, a plot of green uh, cells versus yellow cells over time in these animals. You can see we're at levels of now more than 30 percent 
of green fluorescent protein in the circulation of these animals, as opposed to the standard HIV vector, which gives us about uh, 5 percent. So this is a marked improvement over what we had previously seen. In the second animal, we saw uh, uh, similar results, again, with green fluorescent protein at much higher levels than yellow, showing that this chimeric HIV vector has overcome this restriction to uh, uh, transduction of the hematopoietic stem cells. So I'll stop here and show you just um, uh, an example of the peripheral blood smear of one of the animals where we put in all of the cells just transduced with this chimeric HIV vector. And you can see uh, these are levels of about 20 percent of the red cells now uh, glowing green under the microscope. Uh, so these, again, would be levels uh, sufficient to correct uh, sickle cell disease if this were, in fact, uh, uh, a human hemoglobin. So I'll summarize uh, where we are now using hematopoietic stem cells to deliver therapeutic genes. Of course, we have some initial success in humans using brothers or sisters. Uh, we need to validate this up to 25 patients now, so we're on our way to complete this trial uh, in, in 25 patients. But the biggest thing that we want to do now and that we've started is that if we really do have tolerance, we may be able to move beyond an exact matched sibling because, as I showed you before, most won't have an exact matched sibling. But almost everyone will have a half match. So anyone with a parent or child will, by definition, have a half match because that parent or child will be a half match. And half of their siblings would be a half match as well. So if we could move to what we call haploidentical donors, then we could virtually uh, uh, extend this approach to all patients. So we've started a protocol now testing a very similar approach with haploidentical donors now. And we've transplanted two patients that are very early post-transplant, but both have uh, engraftment by donor so far. Now, with respect to correcting their own bone marrow stem cells, this is going to take us uh, still some more time. We've been at this now for, uh, well, you know, you know, counting before I started 16 years ago, probably 20 years uh, trying to make this work. But I think we're getting really close now to initiating clinical trials again in humans. So now we have vectors that I showed you that work very well for transducing stem cells. Now we have to put the globin back in and see how we do. If we get levels of 10 to 20 percent, with hemoglobin, then we'll go straight to the clinic and test this, first in this related disease, thalassemia, because we need less protein to fix this disease, followed by uh, sickle cell disease. And we do have a clinical protocol uh, that's uh, started with the group at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, Michelle Satellane's group, that's been approved by the uh, recombinant DNA committee, and we've had our initial meeting uh, with the FDA and hope to move forward uh, within the next year. So I'll stop here and acknowledge the crew and see what questions you have. Yes. Um, do you know if anyone is looking at this uh, in the context of Fanconi anemia? Uh, yes. So Fanconi anemia was one of the first diseases to be approached uh, by gene therapy. And um, so there was a group at NIH headed by Johnson Liu that did transplant studies for uh, Fanconi anemia using the older viruses. And so now that people are trying to, to, to re redevelop these kinds of viruses for, for Fanconi anemia as well. So if, um, if there are further successes using this kind of uh, vector system, I'm sure that uh, that will follow as well. Yes? How will your vector work once you go to human clinical trials? Will you have to go back to a strictly HIV-based vector, or will you still use the SIV? Uh, we could do either. Um, and uh, it would probably be easier just to go straight to HIV, because uh, because that's been done now. So there have been trials um, in HIV-infected patients, ironically, using HIV to transfer a gene that makes T cells resistant to HIV. So new T cells that grow w won't get infected by HIV. And um, uh, that's already gone through the FDA, and all of the, all of the safety uh, measures have been validated. So that would be the easiest uh, to move forward with. We're testing now whether this vector works better on human cells as well. So we have a mouse model that's immunodeficient that you can engraft with human cells. And so we're looking to see which, which performs better, because we think this chimeric vector actually works better for both human and rhesus. And every little bit helps, so. Yes? This is uh, potentially very exciting, and I know there's still a lot of work to be done, but can you speculate about the large-scale application uh, there are tens of thousands of people with sickle cell. Um, how 
how many could benefit potentially, whether from their own cells or transplant from a donor? So, you know, there are probably 70 or 80,000 people in the U.S. with sickle cell disease, but there are millions uh, in the world. Uh, so one of the things that we've been very careful to do is try to make whatever procedure we develop as simple as possible so it can be exportable. That's one of the reasons why we use radiation, because most major centers have an irradiator for cancer use. Um, so as far as transplant is concerned, probably 10 to 20 percent of individuals with sickle cell disease could be approached with what we've already published. If the haploidentical transplantation works, then that would be more like 70 or 80 percent. Um, would be uh, approachable using a haploidentical donor. Finally, if we can get this um, autologous stem cell gene therapy uh, to work where we correct their own cells, then virtually any patient with sickle cell disease could be approached. And then it becomes a risk-benefit assessment. There are uh, people that do well with the disease. There are other modifying uh, genes that can um, make this a very mild disease. It's unusual, but those patients would probably you know, you probably wouldn't want to do a transplant of any sort in a patient who's otherwise doing well. But I think if we could get the gene transfer working consistently, then we could approach nearly all patients with severe enough disease to. I, I apologize if this, this already addressed, but um, since sickle cell disease primarily affects or strongly um, affects the African-American community. How are your clinical trials shown in the diversity of the patients going through? Um, are, are your trials as diverse as the disease itself? Uh, actually, yes. Yeah. So, so we've, we've had a, a very diverse population of patients. We, uh, in, uh, among the first two, I mean, among the first 10 that we reported, two are Hispanic. Um, Two are from Nigeria uh, originally, and then the rest are African American. So I think our trial reflects the diversity of, of the disease. But as, as you alluded to, this is a disease that mainly affects individuals who, who live or their ancestors lived in areas where malaria is endemic. And it evolved as a protective mechanism for the more uh, fatal forms of malaria, cerebral malaria, where you get malaria. Uh, in the brain. So one copy of the gene protects from that. Two copies gives you this bad disease, unfortunately. Yes. For the trial that you have done for your 10 patients, um, how long has it been since this presentation? The first patient is five years out. And, and the most recent is one. Are we expecting long-term um, GBHC? Because we all know um, for cancer patients who have done stem cell transplantation, um, at some point, five, ten years, they go back to the hospitals and suffer GBHD. So graft-versus-host disease is most common within the first year after transplant and then goes down after that. Uh, one, of, one of the benefits of a bone marrow transplantation is actually graft-versus-host disease. For example, uh, there's a disease, chronic myelogenous leukemia, that's one of the diseases where uh, bone marrow transplant is most effective. It turns out that a good proportion of the cures are related to graft versus host disease. I mean, we started doing bone marrow transplants because, you know, you give chemotherapy for leukemia and you don't kill it all. And you give so much that you end up killing the patient's own bone marrow. So the dose limiting toxicity is bone marrow. If you take somebody else's bone marrow and give it after you give really high doses of radiation and chemo chemotherapy, you can kill most of the leukemia. So it was thought that that's how bone marrow transplants work. They let you give a lot higher dose of chemotherapy. You give somebody else's bone marrow as a rescue. It turns out that that bone marrow then grows up a new immune system, then recognizes that leukemia as being something uh, wrong and clears it. And the way that that was figured out is that, you know, there were, there were all these indications that graft versus host disease correlates with graft versus leukemia, we call it. So when patients relapsed after transplant, there's really nothing you can do. So we just took some blood from their donors, some lymphocytes, that, you know, just really a blood sample, and squirted it into the patients. And in 80% of those patients, who, who were normally, you know, now with relapse disease after a transplant facing 100% mortality, 80% of those patients had their disease go back away, uh, CML. So those kinds of transplants where you knock the immune system out completely, give a new donor cells, uh, that donor's immune system grows up, it can recognize the tumor and 
or the leukemia and, and, and kill that. So that's, that's something we want to preserve in that setting. But that's a completely different way of doing transplant. In our way of doing transplant, we're trying to just knock the, um, the bone marrow down enough to get 10, 20 percent of cells from donor and at the same time re-educate the immune system that these cells are okay, you don't have to fight them, and the new cells that come in that this patient is okay, you don't have to fight them, and if we get tolerance, to have that balance long term. So we think that it's unlikely that our patients will develop graft-versus-host disease if they haven't during the first year. And these other kinds of transplants, they actually want it. Christina, I'm curious if you could comment on cord blood and use it children that's been used to treat sickle cell anemia and whatnot, but my understanding is that the match doesn't have to be quite as high. As so the match doesn't have to be quite as high for cord blood, so you can get away with a little bit less matching, but it's, it's not that much better as far as graft versus host disease is concerned. The major limitation of cord blood is that you have so few cells that um, it takes a long time for the patient to recover. So if it's a child and you give cord blood, it generally works pretty well. If it's an adult and you give cord blood, it takes a long time for them to recover and there can be complications during that period of time which can be fatal. And finally, if you're not going to completely ablate the recipient like, like we would prefer not to, to keep the toxicity low, you know, it becomes a race between the few cord blood cells that you infused and the recovery of the patient's own cells. And I would think that the patient's own cells would recover first in an adult, and that the cord blood wouldn't, wouldn't be all that effective if you're trying to do the kinds of transplants that we're doing. For leukemias and such, they work well. Uh, furthermore, for our patient population, African Americans, the, the, the genetics are complex enough that it's very difficult to find a match uh, in an unrelated setting. So either cord blood or matched unrelated donors. And we've done that for our patients. I didn't bring that today, but basically what it boils down to is we don't find matched unrelated donors for our patients, nor do we find cord bloods uh, for our patients. So that's why we moved to the half-matched uh, siblings. Other questions? 